unbelief. You know, you either believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or you don't. Being a believer brings God's blessings upon us, you and your family. Unbelief, on the other hand, gets you a destination right along the side of Satan in the lake of fire. And I know this is really, really getting down basic, but this, this message is for teenagers. And I see it time and time again. Teenagers are raised up in a home from the time they're children as believers. And, and you know what, though? When it's time for them to leave the nest and get out into the world, those values and those beliefs are challenged. And whether it's through peer pressure or... I've seen it time and time again that you, you take a, a young person that was raised in a good Christian home and we put them in a college and we've got this ultra liberal professor who knows a lot about mathematics, but he doesn't know from Shinola about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that puts our, our children in a difficult situation. You know, they, they have to obtain a passing grade, and after all, this person, man or woman, is supposed to be super intelligent, you know? And, and they are intelligent in the ways of the world and mathematics, but again, they don't know come here from Sikkim about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, you teenagers, what I want you to get out of this is earn the grades, go to class, Learn the mathematics that that person has to teach you. But keep your values, your religion that you have. Don't let that person challenge. And in some cases, it's not just challenging our values and the values and, and, and the beliefs of the young person. That's ridiculing in some cases. And always remember, though, that mom and dad were right. What they taught you and your values and your beliefs are your ticket to the eternity. Yeah, that person in class can teach you mathematics, but I'll tell you what, mathematics will not get you into the eternity. Uh, there, there is no math that's that, that good. Open your Bibles as we begin our study in the book of Exodus. Israel had a real problem believing. And you know, this, this might seem so simple today, but I want you to think about these people who came out of Egypt, miracle after miracle they saw God perform. They didn't believe. But I know you believe, and you didn't see those miracles. But we're going to learn something from this generation. Let's pick it up. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Now, God has just appeared to Moses from the burning bush is where we're picking this up. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. He hears your prayers as well if you love and serve him. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large land unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the founders of Jebus the last. And these are all tribes, as you know, of the Canaanitish peoples. Many of these, the Perizzites in particular, had mixed with the descendants of the fallen angels. There were a lot of Geber among them. Verse 9. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, the Lord speaking. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee, this is addressed to Moses, unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Well, pretty tall order. Now, you see, Moses at one point had fled from the Egyptians. Why? Because he, he killed an Egyptian uh, trying to protect one of his own of the people of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh 
and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. I'm just a man. And, you know, this is the same thing that you might say when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. Who am I to address the Antichrist? If God says, it's you, it's you. So don't, don't be an unbeliever. Charge. Moses probably thought he wasn't worthy. And that's probably, you know, if you're humble, you're going to think you're not worthy to witness against the Antichrist. But uh, if God says you're, you're on, you're on. Verse 12. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, the Lord to Moses. And this shall be a token unto thee. This is going to be a sign that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. No need to fear. And this token really is for to build Moses' confidence in, in what the Lord is telling him and in his, in his own abilities. Verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they say, shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? You know, that, that's a logical question. Who, who, who sent you? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Ia asa ia in the Hebrew. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. How many times did Christ say, I am in the New Testament? He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the way. I am the living water. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations, and you all know his sacred name, locked five times in acrostics in the book of, of Esther, once in the Psalms, Yahweh is his name. It's good to know his sacred name, verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. I, I know the oppression that the, that the building type, the appetite of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the burdens that they've placed upon you. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt under the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice. The people will believe you, Moses. And thou shalt come thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go. We beseech thee three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And note at first Moses just asked for three days. And I am sure, the Lord continues, that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And in chapter 5 of the same book, Moses would say, Who is the Lord? that I should listen to his voice. You know, you know, I don't believe I know that Yahweh. Get back to work. And I will stretch out my hand, the Lord speaking, and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And here, this, of course, talking about the ten plagues that the Lord struck Egypt with. And I will give this people, referring to Israel, favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. You know, after all, they had been in bondage to the Egyptians for some 400 years. So they were owed, verse 22, 
But every woman shall borrow, this word is to ask or request, in the Hebrew better translated, of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house. In other words, the neighbor and uh, the house, the belonging to the Egyptians. Jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. And you shall spoil the Egyptians. And you're going to take what? they owe to you with you and and none was lacking you know think about it they've been in bondage for 400 years so they didn't have flocks or herds but the egyptians that had to come from them and this gold and silver as well would they believe you know and uh, moses himself would have moments of doubt any, any person would have moments of doubt when given such a, a, a task as Moses was given. Turn to Numbers chapter 11 with me. Numbers chapter 11, let's go with verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Now, the entire book of Leviticus, and the, basically the first ten chapters of Numbers, were written by Moses while Israel was at Mount Sinai. In other words, we're talking about uh, a period of little over a year. But now, finally, after the Ten Commandments and all that happened at crossing the Red Sea and at Sinai, finally they're moving their way toward the Promised Land. But God, you can take from this, God does not like complainers or, or murmurers. This fire was the outer extremities of the camp. Verse 2, And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And, of course, our Father is a consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. But over and over, Moses would intercede on the behalf of the people. And he called the name of the place Taborah, which means a burning, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Moses, evermore finding himself between a rock and a hard place in this situation. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Now this mixed multitude is made up of a lot of the, the people of Israel had taken wives or husbands of the Egyptians. So that's what this mixed multitude is here that came out with the people of Israel. But have you ever noticed that when one baby in a room starts crying, all the babies in the room start crying, whether anything happened to them or not? It's just, that's the way it is. They all start crying. And that's what happened here. The mixed multitude started crying, and then the people of Israel started crying. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely from the Nile the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. All were cheap food and readily accessible in the land of Egypt. But God had been continually feeding them the manna from heaven. And they grew tired of it. You know, and you think of this spiritual level, that, that the word of God to some people is kind of plain and humdrum. You know, to some people, not to you. I know you have an appetite for it. Some people don't have an appetite for the Word of God. But on a physical level, they have to have that sharp and sweet taste that food would bring. And that's what they're talking about here. The greed, if you will, the lust. Verse 6. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. We're tired of this manna. And the manna was a coriander seed. 
and the color thereof as the color of delium. Delium, a fragrant gum, perhaps amber in color. In Psalm 78, 24, 25, we learn that man did eat angels' food. That's what manna was, was the bread of the angels. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it, referring to the manna, in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it states that all did eat spiritual meat. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Verse 10, then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Uh, Moses also was displeased that the people were demanding now they weren't happy with the manna. We, we're bored with this manna. We want meat. And it was continually the way. Never did they say, thank you, Father, for the manna. It was always with this generation, more demands. We want meat. Verse 12. Have I conceived all this people? Did I get verse 11? No, I didn't. Let's do that. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Referring to himself. And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Moses feeling, is feeling caught up in the middle here. This is the voice of despair on the part of Moses, not the voice of unbelief. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth his suckling child, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Do you expect me, Lord, to pick these people up like a helpless child and carry them into the promised land? We're talking about 603,500 fighting men in addition to those who are not old enough to fight, the children, both male and female, the elderly who are too old to fight, and the wives and the women. I'm, I, I guess between 2.1 and 2.2 million people. And Moses is saying, what do you want me to do, Lord? Do you want me to pick these people up in my bosom and carry them into the promised land? They're helpless. Verse 13. Whence should I, Moses continues, have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. And you know, if they truly believed, they wouldn't ask Moses for the flesh. They would go to the Father, the, our Heavenly Father, in prayer and ask Him for the flesh. No, they don't believe. That's their problem with this generation. They're unbelievers. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And this is understandable complaint. Moses was tasked with a tremendous burden. Verse 15, And if thou, referring to God, deal thus with me, kill me. <laughs> like, like Elijah said, you remember? Lord, help me. Just, just kill me now. Let's get this over with. Elijah said the same thing. I pray thee out of thy of, of, of hand, in other words, just to smite me, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness, not see my calamity. The burden of office placed on Moses was really too much for, for any one man. Moses wasn't supernatural. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, that, that the people look up to and respect, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with me. God heard and understood the despair of Moses. Help is on the way. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take the Spirit, and this is, of course, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, 
which is upon thee, referring to Moses, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Responsibility is given to Moses, again, too much for any one man. And, and you know, all of these things, remember, all these things happened as an example, an example, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, as a, an admonition, a warning to those of you of the end times, the latter days, that's now, this generation, where you hear the warning, verse 18, and say thou unto the people, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh, for ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. We had it so good there in bondage. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh and ye shall eat. And the Lord taking care of two problems here. One, the people asking for flesh. Two, Moses crying out in despair. What is it you want me to do? You want me to pick these people up and carry them like a helpless child? Verse 19, you shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days. There's lots of flesh coming. But even a whole month until it come out of your nostrils, and it be loathsome, as loathsome as that manna you cried about unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Always doubting God's plan. Always their own self-will, not God's will. We had it so good back there in bondage in the land of Egypt. 21. Now we're going to see a little unbelief on Moses' part. And Moses said, The people among whom I, who I am, whom I am are 600,000 footmen, soldiers. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. A little unbelief on the part of Moses here. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? That wouldn't be a good idea. We're going to need those herds and flocks to start our herds and flocks when we get to the promised land. If we kill them and eat them out here, we're not even going to have herds or flocks when we get to the promised land. Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? How are you going to do this, God, is what Moses is saying. And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed or become short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and sat them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, unto Moses, and took of the Spirit that was upon him, again the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, and gave it unto the seventy elders, and it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. They spoke that same language that the disciples of Jesus spoke in Acts chapter 2. The same language, that cloven tongue that you, the elect, will speak when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one, the one was Eldad, and the name of the other, Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written. This word is called in the Hebrew. But went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, this is Joshua that would eventually replace Moses and lead Israel into the promised land. The servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Make me, Dad, and Eldad stop prophesying. It's distracting 
from, from your authority, detracting from your authority. And Moses said unto him, to Joshua, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. It would have made Moses' job a lot easier if the spirit of the Lord had come upon all of these. They wouldn't be crybabies. Verse 30. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And there went forth a wind, we learn in Psalm 78, verse 26. This was a southeast wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. In other words, as far as you could go a day's journey this way, as far as you could go a day's journey that way, quail three and a half to four feet deep. That's a lot of quail. The southeast wind, no doubt, blew from the Arabian Gulf, and the quail did fly northward from northern Africa. And this, for those who would be critics of that this actually happened, it is possible because of that. 32, and the people stood up all that day and all that night, no time to sleep, and all the next day, and they gathered the quails he had gathered least. He that gathered least gathered ten omers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. In other words, for them to dry. This is 20 bushels, Dresden, 80 English bushels. That's a lot of quail. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a great, a very great plague. And he called the name of the place Kibroth Hata'ava, because there they buried the people that lusted. Kibroth Hata'ava, translated, means graves of lust. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hata'ava unto Hasaroth and abode at Hasaroth. Unbelief. And, you know, they would go on, the people of Israel would go on to tempt God some ten times, as it's written, if we continued to Numbers chapter 14. First, when they crossed the Red Sea. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you could have just killed us there and buried us in Egypt, but you brought us out here in this wilderness to die at Horeb or Sinai? What'd they do while Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments? They made them bolt and calf a golden calf to lead them. And it went on, the quail that we just read about, one of those. The last and final straw that broke the camel's back with our father was when they said, let's appoint a captain to lead us back into bondage. We, we don't trust the Lord. We don't believe the Lord can actually deliver us into the promised land. Let's go back into bondage. Their own self-will. Paul taught about this generation in the book of Hebrews. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3 over into the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 3, let's go with verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, the anointed one, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Moses had a very, no doubt, God had a very special place in his heart for Moses. I, I think that's the reason that in the last uh, couple of chapters of Deuteronomy, we read that man did not bury Moses. I, I firmly believe that God took Moses just as he took Elijah and Enoch. Verse 3, For this man, referring to Christ, 
was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. And of course, we're not talking about a house made with man's hands here. We're talking about the many-membered body, you. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. God created everything. And, and, you know, we might say, well, an artist might say, well, look at my creation. Well, he wouldn't have had that creation if God didn't create the materials that the artist utilized to create it. So God created everything. We can use his creation to create new things, but uh, he created the elements to begin with. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And don't ever let anyone take your crown. Hang on to that to the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if you will hear his voice, as quoting Psalm 95, uh, verses 7 and 11, and continuing into verse 8. Harden not your hearts. In other words, don't be stubborn, as in the provocation. That's those who provoked God in the wilderness, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And you know, we talk about this temptation in the wilderness. There's a temptation that lies ahead of us, beloved. You know what it is? It's the temptation of the tribulation of Antichrist. You know, that generation that fell, their, their judgment was to die in the wilderness. They didn't enter the promised land because of, of their actions, because of their unbelief. There's a promised land in front of us as well. And, you know, it's what we do during that temptation, the tribulation of Antichrist, that makes sure we have a place in the promised land. And I'm talking about the kingdom of God. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, the Holy Spirit speaking here, and saw my works 40 years, no promised land for them, except for Joshua and Caleb. Verse 10. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart or in their mind, and they have not known my ways. Do, do you know his ways, his plan? So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, into the promised land. In other words, died in the wilderness. Verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You young folks, when you're in that college class and that ultra-liberal professor is there trying to pull you away from God, you know, they think that God is like Santa Claus, that is when, if when you're a young child, it's okay for you to believe in Santa Claus. But when you grow up, you know, you should forget Santa Claus, you should forget God. Don't allow those ultra-liberal professors or anyone else, uh, peer pressure from friends, don't let them take your values and your beliefs away from you. Hang on to your crown until the very end. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened, become stubborn, in other words, through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers, this means associates of Christ. Wow, think about that, an associate of Christ. If we hold, if, there's a qualification, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We don't let someone take our values and our beliefs away from us. 
while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, as those stubborn people in the wilderness who would not believe in God after seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Question. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, no, no abode in the promised land, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Don't make it to where you can't enter into the promised land. I'm talking about the kingdom of God due to unbelief. There's a war ahead, a spiritual war. Jesus taught us in the book of Matthew that we must believe if we're going to war with the devil. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Let's pick it up, uh, Matthew 17, 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him. In other words, taking a posture of, of, of honoring him or worshiping him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed for oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And, and understand, Jesus had already given the disciples the power to order demons or devils out of those who were possessed in his name. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Why, why couldn't they? Jesus had given them the power. What, what was different this time? And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you or put up with you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, kind of over to the side a little bit privately, and said, why could not we cast him out? Maybe, maybe they were feeling a little bit ashamed. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. If you have that faith, the mustard seed, for those of you who may not know, the smallest of all seeds in nature, if you have just that little bit of faith, and a mountain always symbolic of a nation in God's word, and, and I want you to think about it this way, if you have just that little bit of faith is the size of a mustard seed, and you order the Kenite nation to be removed, it will be done. You can do it. As that verse said, there is nothing that shall be impossible unto you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Howbeit this kind, Jesus continues, referring to the lunatic, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And you know, how do we have faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That, that's where our beliefs and our values are, are learned, is right here in God's word. In conclusion, turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. 
next to the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I, this is John speaking, taken to in the Spirit to the Lord's day. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea, including the lake of fire. It was gone at this point. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The last verse of the book of Ezekiel I thought about when I read this. Ezekiel 48:35, where it states in the Hebrew, Yahweh Shema, which means the Lord is there. He's going to be here with us. You wonder how this world is ever going to get straightened out? <laughs> he can straighten it out. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, Shekinah, Yah has dwelt, and they shall be his people, Ami in the Hebrew, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away, all evil blotted out. Won't it be wonderful there? And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The words of God are true and faithful. You can believe them. And he said unto me, It is done, Christ's last words on the cross. It is finished. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8 and in conclusion, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. No unbelievers allowed in the kingdom of God. You young folks, when your values and your beliefs are challenged by peers, your friends, or, or that college professor that we keep referring to, don't let him take your values. Don't, don't let anyone take your beliefs away from you. Yeah, you got to pass those classes. You got to make the grade. You be wiser than the serpent is the teaching of, of God's word. Answer their questions, learn their mathematics, but leave their unbelief and their, in some cases, their atheism, uh, leave that to them. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, it is indeed a, a pleasure to serve you, Father. Uh, we thank you for being with us this day, Father. We thank you for your written word. We lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, protect, in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen. And thank you, Father. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
with those who under after Christ was crucified lived under grace. So uh, Jesus went and preached to them, and as it's written in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, many believed upon him. Betty in Mississippi, <clears throat> what is the best way to praise uh, to pray, excuse me, and get close to God. Well, from your heart. You know, the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, you know, how do we pray? And he told them, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so you pray to your heavenly Father. Now, I don't recommend uh, reciting a written prayer to your heavenly Father every morning and every evening. Uh, he would much rather hear from your heart and, and your mind. You know, he is your father, and you get close uh, to God by studying his word and trying the best you can to do things his way. Uh, and, you know, we all fall short, we all sin, but, uh, and, but that's where repentance comes in, and repentance is the beauty of Christianity because even though we mess up, we can still go to our Heavenly Father with a repentant heart and obtain forgiveness. And the slate is wiped clean. There's no need to walk around with a burden of sin on your shoulders uh, when you can repent and, and it's gone, blotted out. Diane from Tennessee. I have learned more about the Bible and the truth than any other church studying with Shepherd's Chapel. Well, thank you for that witness. I would like to know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It disappeared somewhere in the Bible, and you can find it now in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And you have to know that John, as it's written in Revelation chapter 1, was uh, taken in the spirit to the Lord's day. And where is uh, the Ark of the Covenant at that point? Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, I believe that's where it is today, and that is in heaven, and, and uh, that you can read about Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Dagon in Missouri, and I do propose a question. Can you help me explaining in explaining Isaiah 25 concerning the Lees? We've checked the concordance and have somewhat an idea, but lack in much of the process the Father uses concerning knowing and understanding wine and planting and harvesting. If it be in his will, can you help uh, with this thought of Isaiah 25 and the Lees. Very much appreciate all you servants and your service at the chapel, and thank you for uh, recognizing the staff as you did. I appreciate it. You know, the Lees, as you're referring to, if you have a Smith's Bible dictionary, you might want to pull it out and check it out. Just look up the word Lees, L-E-E-S. But the Lees are the coarser uh, part of a liquor, if you will, and, and its sediment or the dregs, if you will. And, and wine on the lees means a full-bodied liquor, but before the wine is consumed, it was necessary uh, to strain off the lees or the dregs, if you will. And then it is called well-refined as you find also in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6, which I'm sure you're familiar with. To drink the lees or, or the dregs of this was, was uh, symbolic of uh, extreme punishment, if you will. And I make a note of Isaiah, no, excuse me, Psalms uh, chapter 75, verse 8. Uh, talks about uh, drinking the dregs, and that's the same thing that we're talking about there in the book of Isaiah, the Lees. Iris in California, <clears throat> can you please give me a scripture that will help me better understand why little innocent babies are born with or develop cancer only to suffer until death? It is so hard for me. I know they are with God 
but is there a way to know this is for a reason? Is it because they must pass through? Thank you for your teaching. And yes, it is God's design that all pass through the flesh one time. No reincarnation is appointed to man but wants to die. And Iris, I would caution you to be careful not to blame God. And Jeremiah chapter 23 makes it very clear that we're not to blame God for bad things that happen. Uh, they do happen. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about how man has polluted the earth, and we have. Uh, man also, for the most part, we don't eat according to God's health laws. We don't eat clean, in other words. So uh, as a result, we can expect uh, people to become sick and ill. <clears throat> Excuse me. John in Virginia, thank you for your efforts explaining God's Word each morning. I have been studying diligently with you for eight months now. Here's my question. I've been feeling that I need to be baptized, but I feel I need to know in my heart why I'm being baptized. Can you help me to understand? And that's a good question. It's important that, especially when it comes to your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you don't want to do things just because some man said to do it. You know, that, that's how the traditions of men become uh, they actually become more important than God's Word. But to be baptized in, in Matthew chapter 3, you know, Jesus is our example. And in fact, John the Baptist said, you know, I, I really don't want to baptize you, I'm paraphrasing, of course, because I'm in need of your baptism. And Jesus said to John the Baptist, suffer me. In other words, allow it. And John the Baptist baptize Jesus and after all Jesus is our example so he was baptized we should be baptized as well all baptism really is uh, John is uh, stating publicly that you believe that Jesus Christ was born in the flesh he was here on earth and he was crucified on the cross for our sins and he went into that tomb which is symbolic symbolized when you go under the water. And then three days later, he resurrected, and when you come out of the water, you symbolically are resurrecting with him. And that's all baptism is saying, is that you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we all waited until we knew everything that there was to know about God's word before we were baptized, none of us would ever be baptized, and that wouldn't be uh, a good thing. Madison in Louisiana, and Madison is nine years old. Pastor Arnold or Pastor Dennis Murray. Will they have dinosaurs in heaven? Uh, thank you for being such a great teacher, and thank you for studying God's Word. And Madison uh, drew a picture here of a, a dinosaur and I guess this is Madison riding on the dinosaur. And we see the dinosaur here is eating the tops of the tree. You know, there's a lot to be said for that picture. Number one, I'm going to bet that if God wants dinosaurs in heaven, they'll be there. I know that. And, and I'll bet if there are dinosaurs there that we can ride them, just like you've got a picture of you riding. And we also know that if there are dinosaurs there from Isaiah chapter 11, that they're going to eat trees or grass because there aren't going to be any carnivores. That's a big fancy word, Madison, that means uh, an animal that eats, uh, kills and eats other animals. We learn there that the wolf will lie down with the lamb in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. So if we have dinosaurs, they're going to be nice dinosaurs. They're not going to be running around uh, killing uh, other animals or people and eating them. Thanks for your question. You keep studying. Carissa in the Bahamas. Why does the Bible speak about our universe, galaxies, and planets? Now, what does the Bible speak? 
do you believe we would be able to travel to different galaxies after the millennium? Oh, I sure hope so. I have no doubt about it, as a matter of fact. Because in Job chapter 38, verse 31, and the following verses, we learn that God placed the galaxies there. He placed uh, the constellations where they are. And there wasn't a big bang billions of years ago and everything went flying out into space and parked just in the right place to be in orbit and all the other uh, physics that go into it. Your Heavenly Father designed that and, and He placed all of that in motion. So. Uh, I'm certain that uh, in the millennium, uh, if you're familiar with God's Word, you know in Ezekiel chapter 1 that God's throne came to earth, and it was, uh, it was transported on a vehicle. So I'm certain we'll have fantastic vehicles uh, after we leave these flesh bodies. Edna from South Carolina, if you have good parents but they weren't too proud of you, what happens to your relationship in heaven if we both make it? Will we be interacting or not seeing each other? Interesting question. You know, we'll know our relations in the afterlife. Ezekiel 44, 25 proves it. And let me do say this. There will be no uncomfortable relations in the eternity. All that offends doesn't exist anymore. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. I am out of time. I, I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. And you know what? Your Father loves you because when he looks down, he sees from heaven you studying the letter he wrote to you. It makes him very happy. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, beloved, and it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.